James Aladero is the founder and director of Prayer Storm, and he is an instrumental figure in the UK for catalyzing the church into deeper levels of intercession. Prayer Storm believes in practically equipping the church to intercede and is envisioned with a desire to see the church rise up into its destiny as a warrior bride. It is passionate about raising up a generation of believers sold out for Jesus, committed to prayer and radical in their pursuit of holiness. James Aladino is married to Rebecca and they're blessed with a son. On a lighter note, James enjoys quality time with his family, they enjoy holidays, funny films and dreaming together. With a standing ovation, please welcome James Aladino to the Elevation Point. You may be seated. Hello, everybody. I'm going to try that one more time. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Are you tired? <laughs> I'm not going to be very long today. Uh, I live in Manchester, so I bring you greetings from Manchester where God lives. <laughs> well, it's great to be with you. It's, it's been amazing to be amongst all of you as you've been ministering uh, this evening. Um, as I was kind of just uh, uh, being here and listening and enjoying what's going on, being part of the service, I just really felt to start with something probably different to what I would normally start with. Actually, I'm going to pray first. Uh, so can I just have you just... Uh, for a few moments, just engage your heart with the Lord right now. You might want to close your eyes just to avoid distractions. Um, Holy Spirit, I thank you because you're here right now. When we gather together in your name, you're there. So I welcome the manifestation of your presence in every heart. Father, I thank you for the spirit of conviction. I thank you for the spirit of awakening. Right now, Father, even as I speak your word, let there be awakening, let there be conviction, let there be transformation in the hearts of your people, Father. Lord, let blind eyes be open. Let things that have been blocked, uh, where the enemy has used all kinds of confusion to block hearts from experiencing you, let the blockage be removed, Father. This evening, Lord, let there be a release of revelation. Let hearts be open to you in a new way. Father, I thank you that your anointing destroys the yoke. So I welcome your anointing to destroy every yoke of oppression, of addiction, of distractions right now, Father. We say, Jesus, be glorified, just as we've been singing right now. We say, Jesus, take your place on our hearts. Let every idol that we have put in an exalted position Come crashing down as you take your place on the throne of our hearts, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, it's, it's great to be with you today. Um, I'm aware of the time. So I'm going to try to just um, uh, condense a lot of things I was going to share with you. Um, and so we can have some time to pray and be able to, uh, to go home and be ready for service uh, tomorrow morning. When I was sat there, I just felt to share a bit of my testimony with you. Now, I lead a ministry called Prayer Storm, as you heard, and this year, Prayer Storm is 10 years. I've been in there for 10 years. And uh, it's amazing to be doing this because I never thought I would do this. Um, some of you are sitting there, and if you were asked to come on to the front and speak and address everyone, you probably not want to do that. Anyone like that here today? You wouldn't want to come on the, on, the, on, the, on the platform, on the microphone, and address everyone. Anyone like that today? Okay, a few people. Well, I, I hate it. Oh, you put your, why are you putting your hand up? You're the MC guy, right? <laughs> what do you mean you're shy? I didn't see you shy up here. <laughs> so I did not like public speaking. I did not like doing all this kind of stuff. I was so shy, so insecure in many ways. And... Um, from a Christian family. My parents are missionaries. Uh, my dad is from Nigeria. My mom is from Ghana. I was born in Liberia. My wife is from Stockport. <laughs> so I, I, I was brought up in the church and, you know, I've been around Christian activities all my life pretty much. So um, it wasn't like I was itching to be on the platform. I wasn't itching to preach. I did not have any ambition to do what I'm doing right now. But there's some things that happen 
Let me put it this way. There's some things that change in your heart when you encounter God. See, you can come to church from Sunday to Sunday. You can hear messages. You can hear about God and never really know God. There's some things you're never going to know until you experience it yourself. And you see, you may see some adults, you may see some people going crazy and doing things. You go like, you know, you guys are just over the top. See, if you don't understand what someone has been through, don't judge their worship. And don't be quick to say to someone, oh, I want a double portion of your anointing. I want all these amazing things I'm saying. You are, you're saying all the great things that God may be doing in their lives right now, but you don't know what they've been through to get there. So if you want a double portion of the anointing, then you also want a double portion of the troubles and the trials. Are you ready for that? Because God, God uh, prepares his prophets by putting them in the pit of affliction, like he did with Joseph. So if you want to be on the throne, you've got to be ready to go through the pits and the prison. Are you hearing me today? Yeah. So we want the exaltation, we want the promotion, but we have no idea of the process God takes people through. And, you know, I did not really want to be in ministry. I did not have any desire to do this. But when I started to have certain encounters with God, he started to change my heart. And it's hard to describe it. I think of one encounter I had with God where it was literally like I had a personality transplant, is the best way to put it. Some of you, you put your hand up, you said you don't want to come on this microphone, on the platform to kind of speak. Well, imagine you're sat there just being this shy, insecure person that would never want to speak. And boom, it's like in one moment, it's like God just sucked out of you all of the insecure, shy, whatever, and put in you this fire and you can't sit still. And all you're feeling to do is like, you feel like you can speak in front of a million people and you don't care what anyone thinks. How many understand that's a supernatural work of God? In one moment, I encountered God, and this is very important, because many people who have been around church and many people who come to meetings like this, you hear a lot of nice stories, you hear a lot of jokes, and you hear a lot of, you, you, you even play games, you dance, but nothing can ever replace an encounter with God. When you encounter God, the people around you will know you've encountered God. You don't have to advertise fire. Because fire speaks for itself. Okay, if you right there, sat there, if you were physically on fire right now, I don't care how introverted you are. You're not going to tell me it's your personality type to keep still. The moment the fire hits you and your clothes are on fire, you're going to jump up and start screaming. Because something has happened. And everyone around you is going to know something is going on with you. So how can you tell me you're on fire and the people around you can't tell or can't feel the heat? Young people and all the people here, listen, God wants us to not just know about him. He wants us to know him. And when you know him, it comes in the place of encountering him. And one of the things that happens is chains begin to fall off your life. I want to start by talking about some chains that many of you are probably going through right now. Chains of depression, chains of immorality, chains of pornography, chains of lust, chains of confusion, chains of insecurities constantly bombarding man, chains of drug addictions, temptations to try to fit in with the crowd and fit in with the flow without realizing that you're called to, to swim against the tide. Any dead fish can flow downstream. It takes a certain type of fish to swim against the tide. That is who God has called you to be. Now, this is an iPad, right? All of you know what an iPad is. There are parts of the world where they've never seen an iPad before. How would you go to that part of the world in some bush somewhere and not just try to explain to them what the iPad is, but try to explain to them what the internet is? Where do you start? So imagine the people in the bush, I've never seen an iPad before, and somehow the iPad just ends up in the bush. So they are looking at the iPad, wondering what is this? Now, they would probably end up using this iPad to do everything apart from what it was created for. Because they've never seen it before and they have no idea what the purpose is. Listen, 
Where purpose is not known, misuse is unavoidable. If you don't understand why God put you here, and you don't understand why you're here on this, you don't understand anything about your life on this planet, you're going to waste your life on trying to be like everybody else, trying to fit into the crowd, trying to fit into the system and what everyone is saying you, you should be like, apart from who God is calling you to be, you're going to miss your ultimate purpose as far as God's intention for your life just because you have no idea and no revelation about why you were created. And the only place you're going to find your purpose is finding the person that created you because you existed in him before you existed in your mother's womb. Okay, you, you, most of you are church people. You should know Jeremiah 1. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Isn't that what the Bible says? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. God says to Jeremiah, before you got into your mother's womb, you existed. Before you got into your mother's womb, you existed. The question is, well, where did you exist, Jeremiah, before you got into your mother's womb? You existed, Jeremiah, in God's mind. Before Adam got into his shell, the Bible says God formed Adam from the dust of the earth, right? And then when God formed Adam, God then breathed his life into Adam. Now, when God formed Adam from the dust of the earth, what you had there was a shell, an empty shell, Adam was not in that shell. Are, are you hearing me today? Is anyone alive in this room? There's no point in me just talking if you're not here. Are you here today? Or should I come and just see you face to face? Can, can you hear me? Before Adam got into his, into his body that God created, question is, where was Adam before he got into the shell, because God said he breathed into the shell and Adam became a living soul. So before Adam became a living soul, that shell was just an empty container. Are you hearing me? Your body is not you. The real you is spirit in nature. Where was Adam before he go into his shell? Adam was in God. Jeremiah, before he got into his mother's womb, where was he? He was in God. Where were you before you got into your mother's womb? You were in God. And God breathed you and you became a living being in your mother's womb. And now you're a living being. And you think your life is all about this physical world? You're not just a physical being. You're a spiritual being with eternity written on your heart because you came from God. And if you don't get on the pathway of discovering God now, you would end up wasting your teenage years doing everything else everyone is saying. You should, you should dress like, you should look like this, you should do this. And you end up wasting your whole life because you've had no revelation of the person who created you. What a waste of life to just waste all your time doing what everybody else is telling you and what society is telling you and doing everything else apart from the real reason why you were created. Some people can live 70 years and live a wasted life and some people can live 30 years and live the most fulfilled life because they live to the maximum I don't want to get to God on the day of judgment we're all going to face God on the day of judgment and give an account for my life and be in shock because God shows me what he intended for my life and then I realized I just wasted my life see in um Psalms 139, you read about the fact that God has a book about every single person. And all the days for your life were written before one day came into being. So God has a book in heaven. What's your name? Mercy. God has a book in heaven that says mercy. And there's different chapters in that book. And it's I know mercy is also an attribute of God. Now, I'm not talking about the, your name, your destiny is written in a book and chapters are in there. And God has this, when, when mercy is 15, these are the things that I have in my heart for mercy to come. When mercy is 20, these are the things I have in my heart. When mercy is 25, those things are there. But in Malachi, there's another book written. There's another book you read about in Malachi. And it's, it's known as the book of remembrance. In other words, there is a book about God's intention, and then there's a book that records 
your actual life. Are you hearing me? On the day of judgment, both books probably will be compared. What God intended and what you actually did. Won't it be so sad to realize you've just wasted your life? I, I don't know about you. See, I know I'm preaching and doing, I'm speaking right now, but I would give up all these ministries, speaking stuff, just for the purpose of knowing I am fulfilling everything that God had in his heart for me. I don't want to waste my life. Anybody wants to waste their life over here today? I, I, want, I want to fulfill everything that God had in his heart for me. But the fact that I am here singing, Lord, use me. The fact that I am saying, Lord, your word. The fact that I'm singing songs does not mean everything is just going to happen automatically. Because God has a plan. And guess what? The devil also has a plan. God has a perfect plan for your life. And the devil has also perfected a plan for your life. But you have no idea that God is trying to maneuver and trying to woo you and trying to stir you, trying to bring you around things that will, gu that will guide your heart in the right direction. And so the enemy is doing the same. Look at the generation we live in right now. We live in a generation that is bound by all kinds of mess, addictions, darkness, unlike any other generation has ever lived on this planet. Honestly, I wonder how many of you young people are able to keep yourself pure in this generation that we live in. Because the amount of filth and pollution, it's intense. Now, listen to me, okay? Because this is not really a, a preacher message. I'm just sharing with you a burden on my heart. The devil does not go to fight where there are no spoils. Are you hearing me? The kind of intensity our generation is facing right now, in terms of the addictions, the oppression our generation is facing, the young people are facing right now, it's a picture of the fact that the enemy is scared about the potential that God has placed in this generation. So he wants to bind you before you bind him. So he wants you to be stuck in addictions before you rise and set a whole generation free. Why on earth is this generation being oppressed and bombarded by darkness so much? Because the enemy is scared. In fact, he did the same thing in scripture. When there was a deliverer about to be born, Moses, you know what the enemy starts to do? Kill babies. When Jesus was about to be born, you know what the enemy starts to do? Kill babies. Why? Because he could sense that something was about to be released in that generation that would impact not just that nation, but the whole world. So it's like, I cannot afford for this to happen. So the intensity of the oppression increased in that generation because of the potential that was hidden in that generation. Now you look at our generation, there's been no generation like ours. Right now on this iPad, you can access pornography. Right there on your phone, you can access all kinds of filth. You go on Instagram just to look at pictures of your friends and there's all kinds of nudity everywhere. When you're not even looking for it, it's looking for you. Because the enemy wants to bind you before you bind him. And he wants to fill your mind with junk, pollution. See, the scripture of Joel 2, 28 says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. That is an emphasis on the younger generation. Sons and daughters. And then he says, your old men will dream dreams. So the move of God is not just about young people. It's also about the older generation. The fathers and the mothers, see, your sons and daughters prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. In one verse, there is double emphasis on the youth. Sons and daughters, young men, you can add young women too. And then sandwiched between those two is the older generation. So the older generation, if you're here, you're part of the older generation, you're over 40, don't count yourself out. Don't feel like, well, my time is up and I've got nothing. No, no. I believe God wants the wisdom of the older generation to be translated to the younger generation. So people like us are not starting from square one. But we're standing on the shoulders of those who've gone ahead of us. Because God is a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God gave Abraham all the promises. 
But Abraham did not see all the promises manifested in his lifetime. Abraham did not see the millions. Even though God showed him the millions. So God can show you all the generations something that's not about you. And you might think it's your ministry. Actually, it's about the children and maybe your children's children. And what God wants to do in your generational line. So it's time for us to invest in the next generation. And it's time for the younger generation to see that they are part of a bigger picture. And honor the older generation. And generations connecting together. That's what we see the spirit of Elijah. Because it turns the hearts of the sons to the fathers. And the hearts of the fathers fathers to the sons but back to the scripture of Joel 2 28 I will pour out my spirit in all flesh your sons and those who prophesy old men will dream dreams young men will see vision see in that move of God prophesied in the book of Joel the gift of the spirit that's highlighted is what anyone know what gift of the spirit is highlighted I'll pour out my spirit in all flesh your sons and your daughters will your sons and your daughters will so what gift of the Spirit is highlighted in the move of God? Prophecy. The prophetic gift, which has to do with singing and hearing, dreams and visions, encounters, supernatural realities. And some of you in this room are encountering supernatural realities, but on the dark side. Sleep paralysis, torment in the night. You don't realize that the enemy is actually oppressing you in the area that God has gifted you. Because in the move of God, there's going to be the explosion of the prophetic, the visions, the encounters, the face-to-face -face encounters with God, unlike we've never seen before. Now, when you start to see that, then you start to have an understanding about some of the tactics of, some of the, tactics of the enemy in our generation. One of the things he does is he's trying to bind our minds. He's trying to infiltrate our imaginations. He's trying to pollute our hearts. Because the gift of prophecy and the prophetic movement is beyond just a prophet coming here and saying, hey, you in the rest, stand up, I've got a word for you. It's beyond that. It infiltrates every sphere of society. The move, by the way, the move of God coming is not a one-man show. It's not like man of power for the hour who has all the anointing and lays in on everyone. No, no. The move of God that the Lord wants to release in our time is the day of the saints. In other words, every single person is carrying an anointing. You go into your workplace. You don't have a platform like this to speak on. But you go into your workplace and you say hi to your friend. You shake their hands. And boom, God encounters them right there just because of that touch. Because you were carrying his presence right from home into your workplace. And as you touch them, a demon left them. It's not the man of power for the hour. It's you that he wants to use. Now, because God wants to use you, the enemy is trying to get you before you realize the destiny that God has in your life. And one of the things I see is doing in that generation is this. See, there's a, there's a bottle of water right there. And this is a glass. Okay? We have vessels that God wants to use in our generation. That's a bottle of water. That water is pure. Okay? Imagine that water represents the Holy Spirit being poured out. That is pure, and this is the vessel. It doesn't matter how pure that water is. If this cup is dirty on the inside, as soon as the water gets in here, it becomes polluted. Do you see what the enemy is doing? Even though God wants to pour his spirit, he wants to contaminate and pollute your mind. And cause the level of purity in our generation to be almost next to nothing. And I want to say to you, this is not a popular thing, message right now, but I'm not here to be popular. I'm here to tell you the truth. The message of holiness will not draw a crowd in our current generation. But that is the message that will build the end time army of God. If you want to be part of the move of God in your generation, you need to set yourself apart to be a person that will be holy unto the Lord. Now, when I say holy, I don't mean you try to go through all these legalistic rules and regulations. No, being holy is about being fully given to God. And there's no way you're going to be fully given unto God in your lifestyle and still be connected to the things of darkness. You know, when you're wearing white, if I was wearing a fully white garment right now, a fully white outfit, I'm going to be very careful where I sit. I'm going to be very careful where I go. See, salvation is free. 
you've been given the gift of righteousness. That's free. You've been made righteous. Uh, uh, Corinthians says that. We, he who knew no sin became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So you didn't have to do anything for your righteousness. But then even though you've been made righteous, you're commanded to be holy. So you're made righteous, a gift, but then you're commanded to be holy. Righteousness is like the white garment or the white gown you've been given when you become a Christian. And holiness is how you take care of it. When you realize what God has given you and your relationship with him, you're going to be careful what you're watching on Netflix. You're going to be careful what pages you're visiting on Instagram. You're going to be careful what videos you're watching on YouTube because you don't want to pollute your mind. And many of you, your minds are filled with filth. And it's not fully your fault. It's partly your fault, but sometimes it's not all your fault because there's such an oppression. But you've just allowed it to keep coming in. You're not resisting it. How can you overcome an enemy you're cohabiting with? You cannot exercise authority over an enemy you're sleeping with. You first have to break your agreement with the enemy. But in the church, there are many people that are cohabiting with darkness. And somehow the excuse is, well, God is going to forgive me. The grace of God is okay. I've got the grace. Listen, the grace of God is not God giving you liberty for carnality. The grace of God is God empowering you to overcome that carnality. Now, I'm talking to you like this because I have been bound. And that is what I want to share with you. I have been bound by pornography. I have been bound by depression. And when I look at this generation, I see these two things are some of the biggest things that this generation is facing right now. Immorality, lust, but also weightiness of fear and depression like never before. And I stand here as a testimony. It's been almost 10 years since I looked up, since I last had any struggle with pornography. Now, I'm not saying there's no, there are no temptations. I'm not saying there are times where I don't have to turn things off. However, I have not been bound like I was bound. And I didn't just get set free. God deleted images of my mind. I'm not here to preach to you a nice sermon. Listen, you can come here, just listen to a nice sermon if that's what you want and walk out. But I believe there's someone here today and God has allowed me to come here so you can hear this testimony and realize your life as you've been accepting it is not the way it's meant to be because there is something better God has for you than you just accepting this cycle of addiction. Listen, freedom is not the length of time between sin cycles. (laughs) Is anyone alive in this room today? (laughs) Freedom is not, yeah, I was free and I'm okay. I was okay for two weeks. No, freedom is when the cycle is broken. And the thing that used to bind you doesn't bind you anymore. Listen, I'm standing here preaching, but I know what it is to be bound by demonic depression. When I'm locked in my room, I don't want to see anyone ever again in my whole life. <laughs> like, listen, I'm not just here talking theory. I know the reality of the power of God that breaks the chains of addictions off of my life and off of the life of other people. I was in a meeting not too long ago. And uh, I was just sat down getting ready to speak. And one of the, lead, one of the young people who was organizing this event uh, came forward and he was sharing his testimony before I got up to speak. And, uh, and he was talking about an event, sorry, not an event, ministry that he's just started. And so I was listening to him and I was just intrigued by this ministry, a youth ministry he's just started. And then he went ahead and said, he said, you know what, I have been... Um, uh, 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 you know, I, used, I, saw, I was struggling with same-sex attraction, and I think he was probably living a, mo- uh, a homosexual lifestyle. And he says, uh, and God radically delivered me. And I was like, wow. So I'm just sat there just going, just amazed, hearing this guy's testimony. Uh, it's a young guy as well. I'm sure, he may, I don't know, maybe he's in the early 20s. Um, just talking about how God delivered him and broke the chains of, uh, of homosexuality off of his life. Uh, it's not often I hear those kind of testimonies. 
<laughs> so I was very encouraged to hear that. At the end of his testimony, he says, actually, that happened to me at a prayer storm event. <laughs> now, I am sat there. I almost fell off my chair. Like, what? So he shared the story. Now, two years before that event, I was at two years earlier, he came to a meeting just like this. And I don't know why I was preaching, but I was speaking. And at the end, I gave an altar call. And people responded. He said he didn't want to be in that meeting. I think his parents forced him to be in that meeting. And he was at the back, folding his arms, not even wanting to be engaged at all. When the altar call was given, he said he has no idea how he ends up in the front. He's on his knees, weeping. He has a vision. Jesus comes and gives him a big hug. And all these chains fell off of him. And that was his deliverance. That was two years earlier. I gave the altar call, had no idea what happened. Two years on, he's sharing the testimony. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, Lord, thank you for even giving me the opportunity to just hear this. Because you have no idea <laughs> what happens at the altar. When you choose to come and say, Lord, I've had enough of addictions. Lord, I've had enough of oppression. Lord, I've had enough of pornography. Lord, I've had enough of depression. Lord, I've had enough of lust. And right here, right now, Lord, I want to surrender everything to you. And I want to do whatever you want me to do because I want to walk this straight and narrow path. No more games. Right now, Father, I am all in. You have no idea what happens at the altar. When I was struggling with addiction, one of the things I felt to do was to go to my dad to confess. And uh, you might go, why on earth would you go to your dad to confess? But that was actually my deliverance. I went and spoke to my dad and he said, he said something along the lines of, you know, when you're struggling, James, with temptation, that's when I want you to call me. He says, James, don't call me. Um, after you've fallen into sin, oh, dad, it was difficult that I fell into sin today and confessing. He says, don't call me after. In the moment the temptation is intense, call me and say, daddy, I'm struggling right now. Would you pray? <laughs> now, now, that is a difficult thing to do. You know why? Because the power of sin is in its secrecy. The fact that it's just you dealing with this thing on the corner, no one knows what you're dealing with. Your parents don't know what's going on with you and you don't want to share with anyone. The fact that it's in the dark, that is the enemy's territory. You cannot beat the enemy if you're in his territory, functioning in darkness, and yet you want to be free. It's not going to happen. The blood of Jesus works only in the light. So if you want the blood to do a deep work, you have to step out of the darkness into the light you have to expose it now i'm not saying go on facebook and confess your sin to everyone i'm saying you have to come into the light find the person find the people the group that you're gonna live open with i stand before you right now i've got no skeleton in my wardrobes i've got nothing to hide what you see is what you get and god wants you to be pure because there's a great revival he wants to release through you but the enemy is trying to bind you before you bind him. And God is sending me here to say, it's time for you to wake up. Someone say, wake up. Wake up. Come out of the shadows. Come out of... Take off the mask that I've been putting on. Take off the pretense. Yes, I know you can sing. I know you can dance. I know you can play some instrument. I know you're a great artist. I know you're great in this area and that area. But listen, put all that stuff aside. Because the anointing of God on your life is not a sign of his approval of your behavior. The fact that you can sing and someone get healed, the fact that you can preach and someone says hallelujah, the fact that you can dance and go, oh wow, that's amazing, the fact that all those things are happening should not be a sign of the fact that you're doing okay with God. You could have a gift that's just working and have nothing apart from that gift, no depth, no relationship, nothing. And today in the church, it's really sad because we idolize giftings. So when people are gifted, we put them on the pedestal. Oh, man of God. Woman. Now, there's nothing wrong with respect and honor, but sometimes it crosses over into idolatry. And so we are idolizing the gift, and there are people that are carrying giftings, but they have no depth of relationship with God. And so we just celebrate the gift, and we get carried away in the gift. 
You can operate in a gift and have no intimacy. Now, there's nothing wrong with the gifts of the Spirit, but they have to be matching up with the fruits of the Spirit. By their fruits, you shall know them. And God is wanting to raise up a company of believers that don't just know how to sing, don't just know how to dance, but know what it is to lay before the holiness of God. Know what it is to be like Isaiah in Isaiah 6, who sees the holiness of God and everything changes in this whole world. This generation needs to encounter God again. In fact, it feels like we're losing the art of seeking God because we want everything so quick. Pastor, lay hands on me, lay legs on me, lay your face on me, and I want just want to get up and leave this place a changed person. Now, I don't want to undermine the power of laying on of hands, but there's some things you're not gonna get just because the pastor lay hands on you. You have to seek him yourself with all of your heart, not some of your heart, because you're coming to seek God. You're saying, Lord, okay, Lord, I want to surrender to you, Lord, I want to give you my career. But right there, as you're saying, Lord, I want to give you my career, you're holding on to your finances. Or you're coming and saying, Lord, okay, I want to surrender all my finances to you. You're saying that, but you're holding on to some relationships, some boyfriends and some girlfriends. Listen, who told you to go out with that person? Who told you? Oh, yeah, I felt nice and I felt like I was attracted to them. Well, so what? You could be attracted to a thousand people. That doesn't make them right for you. Listen, I started with this. Do you want to waste your life? Or do you want to live a life of purpose? Because if you want to live a life of purpose, then before you start to give your heart to anyone, you're going to first start to ask the person that created you, Lord, what do you say about this one? And if you're asking God what he says about the people who are coming to you or the people you're attracted to, then you're not just making decisions out of emotions and attractions. You're making decisions out of destiny and purpose. And so you don't waste your life. And then 10 years down the line, you start at 13. And by the time you're 19, you've got 10 boyfriends you've had. Broke up this one, broke up that one. Do you realize going out and breaking up is practice for divorce? Why are you wasting your emotions all the time and energy? You're texting, texting, texting away. Talking, talking, talking. All night. All that. And that's not the person God's calling you to. Why are you wasting your time? I don't know about you. This is the way I think. Lord, I don't want to waste my time and emotions on people that are not part of my destiny people that you've not sent into my life listen the devil will send some people into your life for the purpose of derailing you but they're not all gonna come dressed with horns and you know looking like you know like some habilis from nigeria or something you know and incantations they're not they're gonna look like you Dressed in jeans and looking nice. But they, they might not even realize that they're agents sent to derail you. You may not realize. They're conscious agents and they're subconscious agents. And they have an assignment to derail you from your destiny. So you have a choice. To say, God, who is this person? Should I be giving my heart to this person? Or you just forget about God and just do your own thing. Which many young people are doing today. You're coming to the church. You've got secret boyfriends. Your parents don't even know about it. There's someone here right now. Yeah, your parents, you, and you're, you're doing this thing, you don't realize you are destroying your own destiny. Why do you want to do that? I'm not here to tell you God does not want to bless you with a husband or boyfriend in the future. But why would you settle for something mediocre? Why would you settle for something that's just robbing you of where God really wants to take you? And then you get to heaven if you do get to heaven. Because listen, the fact that you come to church does not mean you're going to get to heaven. But you can also get to heaven and realize as God shows you his purpose, you could, you could end up with grief. Doesn't, uh, what's it, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, it says some people's works will survive the fire. Some people's works will be burnt up in the fire and they will suffer. There, there is a pain that would come when you realize what you've wasted on this planet. Listen, this life is a rehearsal for eternity. This life is the internship for eternity. Eternity is eternity. It's forever and ever. This life is only short. Don't waste it on boys. Don't waste it on girls. Don't waste it on things that do not matter. Netflix. Now, I might go on the rabbit trail right now. Netflix. My wife and I had to delete our Netflix account recently. Just because... It seems to me like everything is getting more and more intense. The programs that were at 12, 
all of a sudden became a 15. And even the ones that were 12 were having things in there. I'm thinking, how on earth is it 12? And gradually, the intensity of darkness, and many of you are watching things, you don't even feel anything. That's exactly what the enemy wants to do. He, he's, he's bombarding you with all the swearing, all the filth, and all the sex, because he wants to desensitize you. That's what he does. When you see it so many times, you're now desensitized to it, so you're just used to it. And so you don't realize now you're in the, you know, have you heard of the, I, I, I don't know what it's called, the frog syndrome? Where a frog is pouring hot water, it jumps out apparently, but in warm water, it doesn't feel, uh, on warm water, the frog is okay. And if you turn up the heat, the frog doesn't uh, uh, detect the change in temperature apparently. And that's how you kill the frog. Well, that's exactly what the enemy is doing today to many young people. What we are mostly accepting today, even in the church, Game, I, I hear some crazy talk about Game of Thrones. I, I've never really seen it. I'm like, what I'm hearing, I'm like, how can you be a Christian and you're sat there watching Game of Thrones with sex scenes in it? You think Holy Spirit is sat there watching it with you? Is anyone alive in this room today? <laughs> I think the enemy is turning up the heat. And you're just sat there enjoying it. Don't realize you're being boiled to death. Your spiritual life is just, listen, you've been feeding on all the junk of the world. Then you come into church and they say, praise God. And you wonder why you feel bored. You know why? Because you cannot be eating on all the junk of the world. Come into the house of God and expect there to be a hunger for God. Because you've been feeding your appetite junk all week long. And then you come into church, oh Lord, I praise you. No, your praise is polluted. Are you hearing me today? I'm going to finish with this story. And then I want to pray for people. Listen, it might just be one person. And that's okay. But I want to pray for people that are like, I've had enough of all this junk that's going on in my life. And I want to surrender fully to God. And I want freedom. My wife and I were praying one day at home. And as we were praying, uh, we had our son with us. And he's really energetic. So full of life. Sometimes he can't sit still. So it was one of those days, it was like, this isn't working. We just need to let him go and play. So we let him go and play. And then, you know what happens if you've got children and uh, you know where they are and you can hear them and all of a sudden you hear nothing and it goes quiet. <laughs> you know, I need to check up on them because something must be going on, right? It was one of those moments like, you know what, Rebecca, let's just stop right now. What's Justice doing? I went out and I found him in the toilet, okay? He'd been playing with a toilet roll Okay, and the toilet roll fell inside the toilet. Do you know what he did? He took the toilet roll from inside the toilet and was sucking on it. The moment I saw that, I was like, ah! <laughs> the wife ran and was like, what's happened? What's happened? Her response was really funny. Because when she realized what's happened, she just always said, oh, he's thirsty. I'm like, what, 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 what do you mean it's thirsty? <laughs> we need to get rid of, like, I'm trying to think of how we're going to get, you know, I'm like, God, I hope there was no poo in the toilet. <laughs> Thankfully, there wasn't. But at the same time, I'm still feeling really disgusted. Listen, later on, I realized this. This generation is thirsty, but you're drinking from the toilet. God has put a desire in you that only him can fulfill. But you're feeling that desire with all the junk of the world. So your appetite for God keeps going down and down as you feed on all the filth of the world. So you come into an environment that's meant to be spiritual and you wonder why there's no hunger because your appetite has gone to junk food. You filled yourself on toilet water of the, world, of the world and don't understand why living water is not coming to you and through you. Are you hearing me today? So God is in the business of changing your appetite. Well, you have to surrender yourself to him because he's not going to force himself on you. You have to say, yes, Lord. I believe there's someone here you need to let go of a relationship you're holding on to. And you're like, you know, I like him or I like her or whatever it is. And you're just allowing your emotions to deceive you. Emotions are so deceptive. You have to let God speak to you and realize 
this is going to take you down the wrong path. It's time to lay that relationship on the altar. Are you hearing me today? There's some people here, you're struggling with lust. And the reason why I shared my testimony was not to make you feel guilty and feel horrible because I'm, I'm here to say, look at me. I'm a preacher. I've been there. Thank God for his deliverance. Thank God for his freedom. I'm a testimony of what God has done and the fact that he wants to set you free. So don't cohabit with the enemy you're called to evict. It's time for freedom. You might be here today. You're struggling with depression. You smile and you act like everything is okay. But when you get alone in your room, you know the weight of depression. Now, the different types of depression... I understand that depression can be chemical imbalance and all that. I'm not so much talking about that. Now, if that's you, I'll still want to pray. We'll still have people pray for you today. However, there is de depression that's demonic in nature. That's the one I have experienced more of. Are you hearing me? <laughs> and when I've learned how to worship and pray, I've seen that thing break in one moment. I know it's demonic from the pit of hell. <laughs> so I've been there. If that's you today, I believe God wants you to be free. Maybe you're here today, and maybe all the things I've said may not so, so much be your odd. There may be things you struggle with. However, you've been in a place where you're tormented when you go to sleep. You're afraid of the dark. You're struggling. When you sleep, things are chasing you in your sleep. You're eating things in your sleep. You're, being, you're having sex in your sleep, and you're having all these weird, oppressive things going on around you. And you know it's not godly, but you've not been able to bring it into the light to confess it. I believe God wants you to live in freedom. And I'm going to give you an opportunity in a few moments now to come forward and we're going to pray. And it's not so much going to be laying hands on you where freedom is going to happen, even though I believe that's going to happen. I believe it's in your faith. Choose and say, Lord, I'm stepping out of the darkness and I'm stepping into the light because I don't want to waste my life. I want to live free, free in deed, free in actions in every area of my life. I want to fulfill your calling on my life, God. I want to be holy. I want to be pure. I want you to detox my emotions and my mind from all the junk that have been taken in. Some of you need to go through your phone and delete music and things that you've already... Some of you are listening to music that's just filled with all kinds of hellish and demonic ideas. And you just listen to it and you don't realize, actually, there's so much infiltration of darkness entering your whole being by the music you're listening to. Now, listen, I'm not here to say to you, don't listen to, this, listen to that. I'm expecting you as a believer to start to judge as you see things around you. Lord, is this of you? Do you want me here or not? Is this what I should be listening to or not? I want you to begin to mature in yourself. Now, you may need some help. You may want to go to an auntie, an uncle, a pastor, an elder in your church and say, hey, I'm not really sure about this music. I'm not really sure about this. Is this, you know, what, is this of God or is this something that is going to be dangerous for me? Because I'm not, I, I don't believe that every music that does not say I praise you, Jesus, is one that, let me rephrase that. I'm not trying to say, unless a music say I praise you, Jesus, then we can't listen to it, okay? Because I do believe there's certain music that is not necessarily I praise you, Jesus, but it's actually inspired and it's pure and does not have filth in it. Are you hearing me today? I just need to make that very clear. However, there's things that are from the pits of hell that many of you have accepted as okay in your life. And I believe God wants you to break your agreement with it tonight. So I'm going to stop there. I'm aware of the time. And I want us to pray right now.